Good, loud and clear. Well, hello, everybody. It's it's nice to see so many um, familiar faces, actually. Good to see you. Um, and welcome along. Um, what we're going to do today is a, a double act, which I suppose this whole project has been a double act, really, uh, between me and Anne. And um, what I'm going to do is just explain the genesis of the project, of what we've been doing, what the key research questions are. I'll say a little bit about some of the key findings in terms of the iconography of Mary, and then I'm going to pass over to Anne, who's going to lead you through some of the exhibition items and explain a bit about why they've been chosen. Is there anything else you want to add at this stage, Anne? No, I think that's loud and clear. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Right. Well, the, the project itself started with this painting here, the abdication of Mary Queen of Scots, uh, created by Gavin Hamilton. Um, and it started over coffee in 2015, I think. Uh, Anne and I met in the Gilchrist Postgraduate Club and, and Anne was looking for someone to help put on a small, initially at that stage we thought one room exhibition, looking at the, the painting in context and how it developed in the context really of, I suppose, 18th century British art. Um, and I, at the same time, had been working uh, for a few years with the Special Collections and Archive at the University, um, leading a course called Art, Culture and Patronage in Renaissance Scotland, which was slightly unusual. It, it gave students the chance to do, instead of an essay, a, a research-based placement in one of the collections, uh, and they would each be assigned an original object uh, from the 16th century, and they would do research into it and write it up. And in the year that Anne and I met, it was actually focusing on uh, objects relating to Mary Queen of Scots. So I had found from that that there was a whole range of marrying objects that we hadn't really looked at, charters, medals, objects, um, gaming pieces, a whole range of different things. And Anne had this interest in the reception of, of Mary. And we sat down and said, well, I wonder what we have in, in the university collections. And, we set about um, then in, 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 in 2017, a, a group of meetings with colleagues in Glasgow and with a number of academics um, looking at the richness of the collections relating to Mary. Um, and that's where the, the exhibition has come from really. It's a showcase of all the items relating to Mary that we found in the collection, which as it's gone on, we've realized is one of the world's leading collections of Marian items, certainly in relation to coinage. Um, and also because we own the first romantic, if we can call it that, painting, romantic historical painting of Mary by Hamilton. The project was then funded by the Royal Society of Edinburgh between January 2019 and August 2021. And the brief to the Royal Society of Edinburgh was to look at the collections relating to Mary, not just in Glasgow, but in heritage collections all up and down Scotland um, to take a census of them and understand what objects they had in relation to Mary, um, to understand how they've been exhibited, um, how they've been curated in the past, and also to look at how Mary has been portrayed in art, literature and media more broadly, again with a specific focus on material culture. The main aim in the project, I suppose, has been to understand what changing representations of Mary in material culture from her death until the present day tell us about the nature and construction of Scottish history and identity. In other words, why are certain objects produced about Mary in the 16th century different from those produced in the 18th century or the 20th century? And what is the narrative around these objects? What's the story that is told that goes with them? And as a reflection, what does it tell us about views in Scotland of things like the, the monarchy's role in society, um, the nature of religion and the relationship between Catholicism and Protestantism and other relations in Scotland um, over time? Increasingly, uh, it's been a story right through the, the five centuries of gender um, and how people respond to, to women in power, women in marriage um, and, and, and women in captivity as well over, over the, the whole course of that time. But increasingly, the, the, the representations of Mary that we've been looking at in the very modern period have spoken to um, different, so more contemporary social agendas, um, looking at the issues of diversity, race, gender identity, and these are all aspects that we explore in the exhibition. 
One question that has remained for us is why is Mary, Queen of Scots, so fascinating to people? Why are they constantly interested in her? And has the nature of that interest changed over time? Um, and with all the objects we've been looking at, um, why does it focus specifically on objects personally associated with her? And there are so many images of Mary. Is there such a thing as a true portrait of her? Now, as I say, we, we first met as a group for the RSC project in 2019. Then COVID hit, the project was extended to 2021. Um, we had seven workshops on the RSE project with over 40 contributors. We had a scoping meeting with curators from all over the Scottish collections. That was later expanded to include the Royal Collection, which is a major site in Holyrood, but also the, the British Library. And then we had uh, workshops on text, media and object. The workshops became online only as a result of the pandemic, but in some ways that was a blessing. We had private and closed workshops for the project team in the first year. And then in 2020, we had to adapt them to become online only. Um, we had a range of video and text files associated with each workshop as a form of pre-reading, and the, the workshops were attended by the public. That turned into a research blog with nearly 40 separate short text essays on Mary's cultural afterlife from 1560s up until the present day on a wide range of topics, and you can access those at that link there. It's also led to a, a major exhibition in the Hunterian, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. A range of teaching and knowledge exchange resources, including an online course that we provide for free um, with Future Learn, our partner for this, uh, on Mary. So if you're interested in what we're talking about in the exhibition, you can also do the online course, which will be open in the last week of October. Um, and we've put on, uh, we're gonna put on a range of uh, knowledge exchange activities with the exhibition as well. The final thing uh, coming out of the actual project as funded by the RSE is a collection of about 16 research essays, looking at all these aspects of May's cultural afterlife mm -hmm. over time, how she's been collected, how she's been curated, how she's been represented in film. And that's coming out with Edinburgh and it's due for submission in March of next year. And just before I hand over to Anne, I'm just going to quickly show you some project finds and, and some of my random thoughts on them. Um, one of the key things that I think we've established as a result of um, answering the question of Mary's enduring uh, appeal is down to her iconography and um, her brand for want of a better phrase. Um, in any portrait of Mary, you will find that the iconography of her cap, of her black dress usually, of her religious paraphernalia like her crucifix and her rosary, um, and in some cases her ruff, though this is open to debate, these all define images of Mary, even when, as you can see in these two examples, the portraits look nothing like one another. Um, we have some notionally authentic portraits of Mary from the 1550s and 1560s, but as we move further away from Mary in time, the, 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 the adherence to that portrait is removed. And when we look at the Hamilton portrait, it really looks nothing like Mary, but that iconography remains. And we can see that iconography in the 18th century here. Um, it's been adapted to show Mary, but it's been enhanced by a rather grisly set of iconography, including um, a skeleton and the implements of her execution at Fotheringhay in 1587. She's got the executioner's axe at the base of her uh, body there, alongside her religious paraphernalia. And you can see it even into the late 18th century where this engraving looks nothing like Mary, but the iconography of her cap and her ruff and her dress, they remain, as does what appears to be a prayer book in her hand. The iconography passes on in the 20th century into material culture. And here we get into another big finding of why we think Mary is so important. The commercial and, for want of a better word, capitalist aspects of Mary. This is an example of one of the Peggy Nesbitt series of dolls. Um, they're now collector's items. You can get them on eBay. Uh, produced in the 1960s and 70s and early 80s. Um, and again, it's a doll of Mary. But looking at it, you know that it's Mary because of that iconography uh, in paraphernalia that's attached to her, the cross there on her chest. The, the cap as well, and I suppose as well, the hair. Um, you even see it here in this 
rubber duck, uh, which is sold in the National Galleries, which we're also displaying in the exhibition. And again, it's it it's meant to be a, a, a sort of 16th century Renaissance queen, clearly modelled on Mary. You can see the adaptation of the ruff behind her, um, and it's immediately calling to mind Mary Queen of Scots, I think. We also find Mary in tourism. And again, this comes back to the value of these objects. This bed at Traquair and the cradle are curated and interpreted as beds that Mary and her son would have slept in. We know, or I know from my own research, that there's no way James could have stayed at Traquair as an infant. And um, so the, the, the cradle is spurious. But we know that with the bed itself, that it's not actually a, a bed that Mary herself slept in. It's from a noble family down the road. It's indicative of the type of bed that Mary would have slept in. But it's a good example of how objects can become enmeshed in Mary's story for the purpose of heritage and tourism. And finally, we see Mary in a wide range in the 21st century of film. Um, and we see her in the film starring Camille Rutherford in 2012. Catherine Hepburn in Mary of Scotland from 1936, and the, the slightly less commercially successful Mary Queen of Scots in 1971. These are just three examples of about nine different films that Mary appeared in. And she was the subject of the earliest ever Scottish historical film in 1895, a dramatized 18 second clip showing her execution. So again, media presentations of Mary are exceptionally important now as well. And I'll pass on to Anne now just to take you through some of the material in the exhibition. All right, I hope you are able. Yes, that's it. Well, thank you, Stephen. Um, can you see the slide properly? Um, Looks good, Anne. Is it looking? Okay, great, brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Stephen. That's perfect. Um, and um, Taking over my intention for the next 15 minutes is to give you an insight into what to expect of the exhibition, whilst sharing some of the thought process that went into its making. Um, because as you can see, what Stephen was uh, running you through is quite a complex, elaborate research project that has taken years, has involved many colleagues, you know, both within the university and at with the university. Um, and the challenge was really to morph the result of this research project into an exhibition with a clear agenda that wasn't going to get lost in detail. And, and there is so much to consider over the 400 centuries that we uh, cover in the exhibition um, that to start with, um, for me, it was essential to go back to the original idea of the exhibition, which was very simple. It was just an in-focus um, study of a particular painting and to see whether we could start using what comes out of looking at that painting closely to then build um, the exhibition. So I thought that I would start by going back, so if I can change my slide, that's it, by um, going back to the painting um, with you and, and tell you a bit more about what we thought was really interesting in the painting and how some of the key ideas that came out of looking at the painting closely then allowed us to just sort of build an exhibition um, that was looking at the afterlife of Mary overall. So the, the person who commissioned the painting was a 25 year old ambitious young man, James Boswell, who was a firm admirer of the Scottish Queen and was very familiar with the contemporary debates and publications on Mary's history, um, who were in the 18th century increasingly concerned with working on who was a true Mary. So that really is something that runs through uh, the exhibition, that quest for the true Mary. Um, thanks to a letter dated 1762, which you can see on the screen there, we know that one publication in particular resonated with Boswell, and it was a history of Scotland during the reign of Queen Mary and King James by the Edinburgh historian William Robertson, and there was one specific paragraph that had moved Boswell to tears, and you can see it on your screen, on your screen there. Um, it's basically um, the very moment that Boswell wanted to see captured in a painting, a distressed Mary in Loch Leven Castle being forced to abdicate in favour of her infant son James, one of the most dramatic moments in Mary's life. And for this, um, Boswell turned to um, Gavin Hamilton, um, who 
was a fellow admirer of Mary, as well as a highly regarded painter across Europe for his huge neoclassical paintings that reinterpreted for a modern audience the qualities found in ancient Greek and Roman culture, art, and philosophy. In many ways, the painter was a perfect choice for an ambitious young man like Boswell, who was eager to prove his worth as a fashionable, informed young man. From the painting's commission in 1765 to its eventual delivery in London a decade later, Hamilton and Boswell discussed the merit of written and iconographical sources available to them. And it's interesting to follow how they were questioning the authenticity of some of the sources that were advised to look at. And it's something that we look at in the exhibition. Um, so it really shows that by the 18th century, there started to be an awareness as to whether an image of Mary that was supposed to be one truly was one. Um, and then um, we also know some of the, um, through the correspondence uh, that they had during the 10 year gestation of the painting, um, we have an insight into what they were thinking and, and what their intentions were in terms of uh, the painting. And you can see here an extract from one of those letters. And, and um, what's interesting is that um, Hamilton refers to Homer which is under his pillow as he sleeps. Um, so that's an interesting um, note as to what he was truly interested in and also how he wanted to represent the queen. Uh, he wanted her to be beautiful and he wanted her to be an object not on distress, which is, was obviously his first thought, but compassion and then beauty in his distress is what he really wanted to focus on. Um, Written the year of the 200th anniversary of Mary's abdication, the letter strongly suggests that both artist and patron intended to contribute through this painting to the debate around the true nature of Mary. And to guarantee that it did, they made sure it was shown at the Royal Academy annual exhibition as soon as it reached London, and that was 1776. And it was also made available to a wider audience through an engraving that was published a decade later. The letter also stresses how in tune with a contemporary rising interest in the expression of personal feelings and human psychology, the artist who wished to convey beauty in distress and inspire compassion, and the patron who had been moved to tears by Robertson's sympathetic account of the queen as she was forced to abdicate, where. So how did Hamilton set about creating this image of a queen in distress? Well, he turned to, new, to what he knew best, the classical world and the power of association. So for example, with the two women that are um, on the right um, in the background, um, they're very reminiscent of the type of figures that could be found on Roman sarcophagus. And here I just picked a detail from the Ovest sarcophagus in the Vatican in Rome, which Hamilton would have been familiar with or in prints that would be telling the story of Jesus Christ's passion. And you can see the figure of a woman mourning in the background. And this kind of imagery was very familiar to an 18th century audience. And they would have instantly brought to their mind uh, the ultimate fate of Mary as in her death. Um, so that was one way that he went about that. Um, and also, if we look at the way that Hamilton depicted uh, Lord Lindsay, who, he, who is a man uh, wearing an armor and holding onto the arm uh, of Mary, uh, trying to force her uh, to get on with signing the abdication. Um, you can see that uh, rather than really being evocative of a 16th century lord, it's more reminiscent of Roman uh, officer. And this is what Hamilton's speciality was, scenes um, inspired by the Iliad and Homer uh, that were um, looking or representing the deeds of uh, classical heroes. And by introducing this sort of imagery in the painting, uh, Hamilton is creating a parallel with the story of Mary and those stories from the antiquities that everybody knew. And it really sets the scene to see her as a classical heroine rather than a historical character in many ways. Um, Hamilton and Boswell's decision to make Mary an object of comp compassion and not to let her feature interfere with the overall effect fast-tracked her transition in many ways from a historical figure 
to a fictional character and a much, much loved theme in the art. And it also highlights how in line with many of their contemporaries, particularly those busy re reinterpreting the history of Britain according to the sensibilities of their age, they played a significant part in rewriting Mary's story in the late 18th century. So this is how we decided to start the exhibition. And when I say we, I'm not, this is not a royal we, this is a curatorial we, as I was saying earlier on to Rachel and Stephen, because besides Stephen, uh, we also have um, Jasper Erickson, who is our curator of numismatic, who's been very involved with the tra transforming of the research project into an exhibition. So we decided to start the exhibition with a reminder that Scotland's most controversial monarch has been endlessly reimagined over the centuries since her execution. And to help with our selection, we decided to tease out examples of the many interpretations of Mary now in existence that, held, that had specific meanings for their contemporaries and therefore would give us an insight into their worlds. The result is an exhibition that invites visitors to ponder on the countless, conflicting, at times enigmatic, and often emotionally charged depictions of Mary across time and on their meaning. So when getting down to the nitty gritty of writing the exhibition concept down, we decided to pull in a healthy dose of graphics to help our visual visitors visualize these. Images of Mary taken from the university collection have been printed on boards and hung in the first room. And in the second room, around 140 quotes give a feel for the widely disparate views on Mary. One way to go around the restriction inherent to the display of books where only one page at a time can be seen because there's, there's quite a lot of books in the exhibition. So that was a way to allow people to pick into them um, more than through just the displaying of one page. We also toyed with the idea of starting the exhibition in the present and go back in time, but we ended up opting for a more traditional approach that would allow us to begin with known facts about Mary and objects within the university collection that were as close as one could ever be to the in between brackets real Mary. This way, anyone who was not too familiar with her story could get a grasp of the bare facts before starting to explore the story of her life and make up their own mind. Um, so the first room is looking at Mary as a French princess, a Scottish queen, and a captive, and highlights include charters that were issued by Mary or her mother during her lifetime. The beginning of the development of a binary view of Mary through books such as John Leslie, um, that um, are really um, starting to create um, the division in between good Mary and bad Mary to simplify um, very, in a very basic way uh, how she's been perceived. Um, coins play an important role as well because they give us a real insight into how Mary wanted to represent herself in during her lifetime to her subject. Um, and also objects associated with Mary. As Stephen was showing earlier on, the bed at Tracker House, which is associated with Mary when there is no chance really that it could possibly be. And here is a book that comes from the, the, the Spanish edition of um, the Iliad, Los Doce Libros, um, which was published in uh, 1557 in Amsterdam and has at the end a signature that allegedly could be of Mary. And it's, it was just a way of bringing from the very beginning those ideas around question of authenticity and whether objects that say they have, are associated with Mary truly as, oh, oh, truly are. Um, we also have in this room a painting that is, nope, I moved too fast, sorry. My key seems to not be functioning very well. Right, ah, oh, apologies for that. Come on, right, I'll try and see if I can do it that way. No, I can't. Uh, something is not quite playing ball. Why is that? Right? I think I may have to give up on that. The next image is not wanting to come up. <sighs> right. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that. I wanted to show you a painting that is coming from uh, Abbotsford, um, or known to us, which is um, representing the head of Mary, Queen of Scots, supposedly painted shortly after her death. And that's another way of introducing in the exhibition um, this idea of authenticity and, and whether something could truly have uh, been painted um, 
at that time. And it's also for us a very, um, it, the, one of the interesting facts about this painting is that it comes from Sir Walter Scott's collection, um, who um, wrote that if the painting was really executed the day after the murder, um, it is a first rate curiosity. And I think that's, that's just a key, uh, that interest in Mary and anything that went back to her time was really of, of great interest. And Mary, Sir Walter Scott is, um, a character that we follow throughout uh, the exhibition um, and that we will uh, come across a little uh, later. The main body of the exhibition deals with power games and politics, um, power games and gender, and one last area which looks at the context in which the Hamilton painting uh, was created when Mary goes from being a historical character to increasingly being perceived as a heartless heroine of a tragic drama. In Power Games and Politics, we explore the rival accounts of Mary's life and character that begin to emerge from the moment she's forced to abdicate and the way they were used politically, religiously, and within the context of the debate of the right of women to rule throughout the centuries. So in the next couple of slides, this one included, I want to give you a taste of what to expect. Um, so those two images are among the earliest known engraved portraits of Mary. Um, and the two others we will look at later on um, are just jumping to the present day. So on this screen, we have a book which was published within months of Mary's death um, and was written by Adam Blackwood, who was a supporter of Mary, um, about the martyr of the Scottish queen, Le Martyr de la Reine d'Ecosse, published within months of um, her death. And uh, it marks the beginning of a huge outpour of devotional material, lamenting her execution and portraying her as a martyr to the Catholic cause. Its frontispiece hints at a brisk trade in the reproduction and circulation of engraved portraits commemorating her death. And the source of the engraving, one of the very few likenesses of Mary in her later years, still considered potentially truthful, is a portrait print by French engraver Thomas Deleu. And you can see the same engraving being used in a print that has a very different feel right next to it. Um, that print um, was made by the Werricks brothers um, and it includes scenes of the execution of, of her death as well. It's um, one of the earliest, but definitely not the last um, um, image to be derived from that supposedly authentic uh, portrait by Thomas Delu. And its authors, the Werricks brothers were based in Antwerp. They came from a well-known family of engravers patronized by the Jesuits. And here they use this depiction of Mary's execution, which they also came up with uh, very shortly after her death to complement the portrait. Um, and some contemporary broadsides actually um, claim that the portrait in this particular engraving um, if it was supposed to represent Mary on the eve of her execution. It celebrates her virtues and refers to her and I quote, being imprisoned for 20 years and slain by the foul command of the Virgin Queen of England, end of quote. The resulting print is among the best known propaganda images of the early 16th century, presenting her as a martyr for the Catholic cause. The print was reused in numerous 17th century publication and Dolores portrait type was often made to express different ideas around her political, religious or dynastic role through the addition of text and or other image as in here. Now jumping four centuries, uh, we get to the present day and on your screen you have uh, on your left um, and digital print by Rachel McLean called The Queen. Now, Rachel McLean is a Glasgow-based video artist and printmaker, and The Queen is part of a series of works created in the lead up to the 2014 referendum on Scottish independence. And the artist stressed then how she drew, and I quote, on the historical mythology of Scotland rather than the actual history, end of quote. And a little later, she also said, quote, so much of what we identify with it in terms of historic, uh, historical events somehow get reinterpreted into contemporary politics or identity, end of quote. I don't think I need to say much about the print. It speaks for itself with its reference to 
traditional iconography, its fun take on two very well-known characters um, within the story of uh, Mary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then next to it, we have uh, another digital print by Frank, Frank Quitterly, who is born and based in Glasgow and is a graphic artist who's earned an, a worldwide following um, with uh, best-selling titles that include New X-Men and Batman, for example. In 2019, um, he um, was approached by members of the research project. Um, uh, and we asked him whether he wanted to be involved in one way or another. And he responded to the project by imagining what kind of character sheet he would devise for Mary. And the character sheet is usually um, what comics artists use as a point of reference, a starting point when they want to create a new character. Um, so for us, it's really wonderful to have this in the exhibition because it allows us to point out those symbols that um, Stephen was referring to earlier on. And you can see, for example, we've got the scepter, which when it's not broken, um, alludes to royal authority. And when it is broken, alludes to the um, abdication. You have the red corset, which um, alludes to the um, martyrdom of Mary Queen of Scots, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're hoping that by having this in the center of the exhibition, it will allow people to go and pick themselves the symbols around the different images of Mary that are included um, in the exhibition. I particularly like the fact that he based Mary on the Gavin Hamilton painting as well, so he kind of brings it all together in a rather nice way. Now the last a taster for this section stands for the group of works aiming to illustrate how Mary's story has been used in the context of deliberations around the right of women to rule. Um, so on the right hand side, you have Liz Lockhead, Mary got her head chopped off, which was first uh, played on stage in 1987. Um, the University Archive and Special Collection has a group of material related to the play, and that includes a number of programs, and you can see two of them there. And it was really important to include Liz Lockhead in the exhibition because she chose to represent Mary as a woman, woman first and foremost. And she uses her story to reflect on contemporary issues of nationhood, sectarianism, and limitations on female autonomy. Um, what was really important to us as well is that um, we have a, well, she's now graduated, she has her PhD, but at the time there was a postgraduate student near Clark who was working specifically on the play, and it allowed us to bring her into the project and also to um, contribute to the labels in the exhibition. So it was very nice to be able to showcase some of her work in that way. And next to it, we go back to the 17th century. This is a print made by Gilles Rousselet and Abraham Boss after Claude Vignon. And it's um, among the key representations of Mary in 17th century France. The print was originally conceived as an illustration for a book called The Gallery of Strong Women, which was published in Paris in 1647. And in this book, Mary was one of 20 women chosen to exemplify leadership qualities of both, both body and mind. The book was dedicated to Anne of Austria, who was then mother of Louis XIV and regent of France, and it contributed significantly to the debate that began in the Renaissance and was raging in the 17th century, which was concerned um, with the role and capability of women. Um, so it's really nice to have those um, together in the exhibition. Now the next chapter in our story revolves around the context in which Hamilton and Boswell came up with their painting describing the abdication um, and the rise of Mary as a hapless heroine of a tragic drama, as one contemporary publication put it. An important component in that story revolves around Sir Walter Scott's key role in the development of new stories around the Scottish Queen, represented in that section by a group of prints and an illustrated edition of his famous novel, The Abbot, that takes the reader through the imprisonment of Mary at Loch Leven, her enforced abdication, her escape from the castle, defeat at Langside, and flight into England. First published in 1820, the novel marks the moment when Mary firmly becomes part of the national narrative and a romantic figure in people's eye. In his introduction, Scott emphasizes Mary's wit, her beauty, her misfortune, and I quote, the mystery which still does and probably always will overhang her history. And it's still valid to this day, I think, in many ways. Um, and then we go into iconic Mary. Stephen actually gave you 
a fair amount of clues as to what you might find in that last room. So I thought I would just give you a very quick sneaky peek of some of, uh, at some of the objects and um, some of the themes that we are tackling in that room, such as marine commemorative medals, marine comics, uh, virtual Mary, Mary on stage, on screen, as a cinema celebrity, and commercial Mary. Um, and um, finally, I will finish with a couple of slides images of the exhibition as it being built up. So this was taken this week. So this is really a, a really fresh sneaky peek behind the scene as to what we are up to. And you can see there that there is a large cinema screen which will allow us to um, uh, present some of those films that uh, Stephen was referring to. And um, on the other slide, this is the wall that is dedicated to virtual Mary. So the screen will have some of the um, highlights of what you can find online. And then on either side, you've got quotes that are taken from Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. That really brings this interpretation and understanding of Mary right up to the present day through as many voices as we can. And I will stop here and I thank you for listening. And I think Stephen and I are available for questions if there are any. Thank you.